Uh, thanks, Khaled. So um, it's a pleasure to uh, be part of this panel. Um, it's actually really, I just want to say before I forget, it's, it's actually really nice because um, one thing I strongly believe in is for um, Arabs and Arab Americans to be recognized as a um, minority or just a different ethnic group. And it's nice to, to see uh, this group of people here. So, um, um, so to answer your question um, about uh, how, is, how is the industry gonna change? So um, I work in retail and logistics a lot. And one thing that we see now is that the presence of online retail has grown even more because of the pandemic. Um, so um, many people, especially uh, in cities, relied heavily on um, deliveries uh, for retail products, but also for food from restaurants and from grocery stores. And I collaborate with, um, for example, Fresh Direct, which is a very large online grocery delivery company. And um, even now, as things are opening up in New York more and more, a lot of customers have now stayed um, using the online grocery platform and some big grocery stores have closed down probably for good. Um, so I think this is one way where we expect uh, some change to, to remain um, permanent, um, that more people are shifting to this online delivery, which is ultimately, I think, good for the environment. Um, when you have people driving less to do errands and you can just rely on couriers to centralize some of that. Um, and um, in retail, I think a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of the smaller stores um, suffered more than the corporate stores because the corporate stores were able to adapt by quickly coming up with IT solutions to allow for buy online pickup in store. So we, or curbside pickup, you may have heard of these things. So the ones that were able to do this quickly survived reasonably well, um, such as Macy's, for example, and other stores who basically weren't able to have the IT to do that, like a mom and pop shop or um, others suffered, suffered more and a lot of them went out uh, permanently. Um, so I think a big change is, is on the, just the online shopping behavior and, um, with respect to safety, a lot of uh, stores are now telling me that they are gonna permanently force their workers to, every time they come in the store, they're gonna have to sanitize and do a temperature check. And they actually wanna keep that because they've noticed a lot less sick days just from things besides COVID. So there's a lot less infection going around of just colds and stuff like that because people are being so safe. And this is actually has a lot of value for both the employees and for the companies. Um, so just, increasing health standards all across the board, I think is gonna be permanent. So I'll stop here for now. How about your, the effect on academia in general and your teaching? Oh, um, yeah, so I've, I've been teaching remotely for a year um, or more. And I can say that um, the good thing is I think professors are here to stay and universities are here to stay. I, I don't think anyone really enjoyed online teaching and uh, the students don't enjoy it, the professors don't really enjoy it. Of course, you know, there is a value in online education to provide access to a lot of people in the world um, to the form of MOOCs or massively open online courses, but those have had actually less impact than we thought. Um, at the end of the day, people who can't um, you know, afford education also will struggle to have the free time and the and the mentorship and the resources to do free education anyways. So, um, you know, I think we will do, I think there will be a lot of use of video recordings, but um, in the future, but I think having a live presentation and, and a community um, is essential for, for student learning. And um, I've had to adapt quite a lot to make sure students actually talk to each other and communicate. I've forced people to work with each other. So I've, I made like all my assignments into group projects um, with random people across the world because I found that no one was collaborating. Um, even people who are supposedly friends barely talk to each other. Um, so um, having a, a group learning environment in engineering is essential for learning. Um, and I'm sure in other disciplines as well. So I think 
that's a lesson we've learned. Um, unfortunately, you know, there was some, uh, I don't think the price of Columbia tuition changed uh, much, if at all, um, for this lack of experience, but you know, did, I can understand why. Um, but I think in the future, um, in fact, we should actually double down on in-person education and let online education be a separate entity rather than trying to do both, because I think they're very different. Great, thank you. Um, why don't we move on to Siham? And how- Thanks, Khaled. And it's a pleasure being on, on this panel. Thank you so much for inviting me. I think maybe I give a bit of an intro about Deliveroo, given that it's a, a UK-based company, maybe a bit more in the news recently, but um, we're kind of um, what I would describe kind of like the DoorDash of, of Europe and, and parts of APAC uh, and the Middle East. And, and I run the business here in Kuwait. Um, and I have for the last two years, we, we built it kind of from the ground up. Um, and, you know, over the last year, I think what we've experienced with COVID has been, I think, unique to a lot of different industries because we do online delivery and food delivery has, has kind of come into the limelight uh, almost as a, uh, as a necessary service because so many people are spending time at home, obviously, and, um, you know, have less and less occasions to celebrate. And so food delivery has become um, kind of a, a critical service um, at this difficult time. And I think we've seen that. I've seen it in Kuwait. I've seen it across all 13 markets that we operate. Um, and so we've seen these strong tailwinds for us as an industry. I think the industry has changed because we've seen so much more exposure and new customers trying online food delivery services, you know, which is then extended into grocery service, meal kit services that, that we're kind of adapting to offer. Um, and, and so I think the biggest change in the landscape for us is just kind of openness and willingness to try. Um, and so we've seen just kind of a huge influx of new customers and, and customer ordering frequency. Um, it's difficult to say, I think, you know, we've talked a lot as a management team and, and as a team here locally and globally around what we think the future holds after COVID, what happens when things start to open up. And, um, you know, we're struggling to really get a hold of, of what those trends will look like. I think so far in some of the markets where we've seen things open up more than others. Dubai is a good example. You know, we've kind of seen similar behaviors from consumers. Uh, not sure if it's, you know, 12 months of kind of getting used to ordering and, and frequency of, of food delivery has kind of stuck, but um, early signs are that, you know, people still want to order at home and, and you know, ones who've been, who, who are new to the food delivery scene um, tend to stick. Uh, but I think we still have a long time before we really see the longer term kind of permanent impacts of, of COVID on, on food delivery. Uh, on the consumer. On the restaurant side, I think we've seen restaurants just, you know, um, everything's been upended in countries like Kuwait where dine-in has been, you know, completely sh shut down. Nobody can go into a restaurant and eat. And so their entire survival depends on food delivery and our ability as, as logistics providers to, to deliver uh, kind of the capacity of meals that are being ordered. Um, in Kuwait, I think that's one of the things that we've really had to ramp up. You know, can we deliver enough meals? Can we keep up with the demand? Um, you know, to, to save restaurants essentially from, from closing down. And so we've seen a lot more reliance from restaurants on, on food delivery partners um, in terms of what advice we can offer, how we can optimize their service, how we can, you know, help them manage their overall p and um, And so it's been a really interesting shift in the way the partnership works. I think that's something that we'll see continue in terms of kind of the strong collaboration, the dependence on food delivery uh, restaurants, even looking at, at you know, delivery only kitchen options um, as kind of the future of new sites and expansion, which has been really interesting. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, those are kind of the industry at large. I think me personally, what I've seen for myself, for my team, for the team I work with is, uh, you know, this, this phenomenon of, of kind of working from home and, and how it's changed our ability to be productive, how it's created flexibility for a lot of people um, and what we as kind of leadership teams want to do with that going forward. I think you know, we want to build in some flexibility and work from home opportunities for people as we move out of the pandemic, um, you know, but figuring out the right balance of that, I think, um, will be something that, that we work on in the next kind of couple of quarters. But we've already put in policies that say, you know, people can have up to two days working from home, um, you know, going forward after people have been vaccinated and can go out. Um, and I think people just really appreciate that. I, I personally appreciate it. It gives you that the ability to work from home, you know, while knowing that it's kind of the norm versus um, the exception of, you know, I want to do a day working from home, um, you know, uh, once every couple of weeks or every couple of months. So I think that's something that's here to stay. And I think my team personally and, and kind of the broader delivery team has, has really appreciated it. Um, 
but yeah, I think remains to be seen where, where we really land as a business, as a company, you know, as Deliveroo and I think other similar food delivery startups and, and larger companies, you know, where this business ends and how long we'll see these tailwinds um, and if they are indeed tailwinds or real shifts in consumer behavior. Thanks, Sam. Um, Sam, how about for you in the film and media industries? Well, you know, uh, thank you for having me on this panel. I, uh, I graduated in 2005. I haven't, I taught a little bit at Columbia right after, but then uh, it's been a while since I've been up on campus. So it's good to be part of the community again. Um, I, I, from my perspective, you know, the film business, it's always been challenging, even before COVID, especially when we talk about international productions, you know, the kind of films, uh, you know, coming from the Middle East, make it, making movies into the Middle East, bringing it to the, to the, you know, to the international market has always been a challenge. So what's interesting, I mean, what I would like to talk about here is I came, you know, out to write, I finished my festival run of my last film um, and the pandemic hit. And, and it was in a, in a very interesting uh, uh, period of my life and in my career where I've been making films in Palestine and I've been, involved in a lot of European co-productions to make my movies but I live here in the U.S. and I uh, so I that was my decision to move in into the American market a little bit and start to get engaged in in um, in the film business here in the U.S. and it happened during that time and of course I continued to be engaged in both uh, in both the international and the local sort of the U.S. market. And, and it's very interesting time because in many ways, the pandemic caused a lot of people to watch more content. Uh, so, so the rise of the streamers became a, a major factor in what we do now. But it's very risky because there's only certain movies can be made now, especially with the pandemic films that there are naturally bigger budgets, big stars, that they can afford uh, to shoot movies or TV shows uh, while adding another, another part of their budget to take care of testing and, and, and quarantine and all of this. So as a result, a lot of the independent uh, industry, film industry was hit. So a lot of films have not been made uh, because the budgets are small to accommodate all of this. And as a, con as a con consequence of this, the, the sort of the international film market has been really slow. So we see more, I would say, star-driven content uh, uh, financed by the big streamers, not even the, the studios anymore. Like we're talking about Netflix, Hulu, uh, Amazon, and, and those independent films that we, we, we are making and that they go to festivals and they travel around our, our really been hit hard. So uh, in many ways, the industry adjusted itself where you'll see people who are in that independent, who have a very specific, you know, cinematic voice, have been spending a lot of their time developing material, hoping that the pandemic will end. So there's that phase of working and development that's almost extended itself for a very long time than the usual. Uh, but as a result of it, I feel like a lot of filmmakers who probably haven't had a chance to make films will walk out of this uh, pandemic with a lot of content in a time that people have seen everything else <laughs> on the streamers. So I'm, there is hope uh, that at the end of this, that will these new, fresh, independent voices will be much needed. Uh, uh, and hopefully theaters will open up and festivals will go back to function. But, but I would say it's... It, like we always do as filmmakers in that creative field, we always adapt to the reality, almost like a, we're not a, a necessity of some sort, we're not bread on the table. So we are the entertainment factor of this, but um, culturally we most likely, I think, uh, be affected by the lack of certain voices. But as, as we see nowadays, diversity is becoming an, a major issue in the industry. So. So there's a lot of good things I think to look forward to, um, and teaching wise, it's been it's been challenging to be you know to be teaching online, uh, but it, it worked in some classes. But uh, uh, I think production classes have been hurt as a result because it's all about being together in that room making movies, 
which now with masks and all these guidelines, it makes it very hard. But what's interesting is always filmmakers will always find a way to tell their stories, even with these limitations. So it was very inspiring for me to see that, like even with the fact that you can't have two people in one room, uh, uh, so you can't really do certain movies anymore. Like you can't have people hug each other or there's an, another guidelines that you have for that to happen on screen. Uh, and you find, you know, filmmakers creating very interesting work as a result. Uh, but hopefully we are at the end of it and, uh, and we can go back and, and, and produce more work and be on set. Um, so, I mean, given long term, do you see like, uh, this will lead into the next question in terms of um, the long term landscape and the pandemic and how it affects whether they're going to stick around or not? Do you see like some type of COVID czar on the sets of, uh, of film productions and things like that affecting the way productions are done? And will the vaccines help in that regard as well? Yeah, I think we'll probably stay in that in that world for another year or two. I think you know, I think the more uh, the more you know, more people vaccinated, I think it makes it easier down the road, especially with productions. But um, but yeah, it's gonna it's it's gonna it's gonna it's gonna cost more to make movies as a result. And as I said, you know, certain movies can handle it budget wise, but sadly, films that come from our region. Uh, don't have that capacity and I feel like you know like making the next movie uh, you know in Palestine or Jordan or uh, you know depending on co-productions with Europe is, is a big is it was really hurt the most because part of that co-production structure that exists means you have to work with Europeans also in your film so let's say you make a movie in in Palestine with some French money or some Belgian money Part of your obligation is to bring French crew to be on set with you. And now with international travel, you know, many international cannot go. So you cannot really uh, have that happening right now at, at this moment where you have your French uh, photographer and uh, come to, to Palestine to shoot. It takes, it takes, um, uh, so it, it, it takes, uh, it takes a lot longer time and more, more logistics to deal with. So I, th I, don't, I I see this to be a struggle for the next, I would say, a year or so uh, until we will be able to see new uh, films coming out of the region. Unless the streamers, which is that, that their promise, you know, Netflix and all this, they always promise to tap into the Middle East as a market, for example, or the international market. Uh, but that promise is, is very slow. I mean, it translated itself over the pandemic or the the last two years, maybe like three, four TV shows that Netflix invested in. And that's not enough um, in many ways. Is that the same for like a bigger market like Egypt as well? Egypt, yes, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the only thing is, is, I would say even the streamers, when they look at the Middle East, uh, Egypt becomes a player for them because it's, it has the star system in it. Uh, other so to make a film in Saudi Arabia or in, in Iraq and or or in Lebanon, it's a little tougher because they don't have stars there that the public will go and see. And see. even if it's a streaming, that's that that's so. They I think I would say Egypt has been a leader in tapping into the streamers in uh, in the Middle East, and I think most of the shows that they made were made in Egypt. Uh, Siham, how about you long-term? I know you start to touch upon it when you were answering the last question. Yeah, you know, I, I think honestly, it's it's very difficult to say. Like, I think that's something we're all bracing ourselves to try to understand as a company for, for planning purposes. You wanna to try to get a sense of what's gonna happen. You know, we're all about forecasting and planning as a logistics company. And if we can't forecast or we don't, you know, usually you look at your cohort of behavior over the last X months or years and you say, okay, I know the trend here. I know the cohort behavior and now, we're in a position where we're, we're, you know, it's very hard to say. I do think that there is consumer behavior that's shifted that that's here to stay. I think maybe in a way it goes hand in hand with with the movie and streaming industry. Like one of our top, you know, top ten restaurants on on the platform today in Kuwait is is our lo like the, the biggest cinema chain in the country. Where you know they have the popcorn and the nachos and people are just ordering it nonstop and watching at home. And I think as kind of more occasions 
um, shift from being kind of a, a going out occasion to let's stay home and, and let's watch, you know, Netflix or streaming service or the latest kind of blockbuster on HBO that goes hand in hand with let's order food, let's order popcorn, let's, you know, we built these new kind of occasions for people to order or let's order a meal prep kit that we can make at home. And I think those, you know, 12 months is a long time. I mean, it's not as long as kind of cons inherent consumer behavior that builds over decades and, and, you know, longer periods of time. But I think uh, my expectation is, is that a lot of these things are here to stay and we will continue to see kind of the momentum of food delivery and home delivery and kind of at home occasions um, and bigger kind of group settings and group meals stick. And, you know, if Dubai and, and UAE, which has been kind of the market that's the most quickly shifted back to quote unquote normal, uh, if that's any indication uh, of the pattern, then, you know, we believe that's here to stay. I do think that probably there will be a, a period of time right after things open up that uh, especially in a country like Kuwait, where, you know, it gets very hot in the summer, people are used to traveling, uh, and maybe this exists in a lot of other markets too, there's kind of this exodus, everybody's kind of leaving to, to travel. And so I think it shifts kind of the behavior and the patterns and the overall kind of demand for, for you know, um, e-commerce and, and food delivery services. But, you know, I think long term as an industry, things are, are shifting and it's probably not going to change. And I think even internally, companies are, are have changed. I think our capacity for risk taking, for, for being agile, for being quick to kind of adapt and react, whether it's our product team in, in London that's had to, you know, product teams are used to setting kind of roadmaps and plans and sticking to it. And, and you know, they don't like to change things so much and they don't like to do things on short notice. But I think we've had to adapt to you know, building contact free delivery in, in a matter of a few weeks because we needed it or, you know, shifting grocery plans and, and moving them ahead of time. So I think even as companies, I think the ability to be more agile, more quick to react, quickly deprioritize when needed and, and react to things, um, including things like shifting completely to work from home. I think that's here to stay because that's, you know, it's almost baked into our mentality now. Um, you know, being prepared 12 months, like I said, is a long time. There's multiple waves of, of this pandemic. And so I think the ways of working, the ways of reacting, the ways teams built themselves to be agile and quick to respond, um, you know, I, I see that kind of sticking with us. I think that's the part that's really permanent um, coming out of this pandemic. But, you know, consumer behavior, we all wish we could, we could see where it's going, um, but we'll see. I think the next six months will be telling. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Adam, how about you? Um, thanks. So um, I've, I've been actually really enjoying listening to the food delivery and, and media perspectives. Um, so um, I actually I thought I'd take a chance to um, talk a little bit about a research project that uh, my lab has been working on. So we're looking at the sort of not maybe long term, but the medium term uh, for the next year or so while, while the pandemic is still happening. Um, that a lot of businesses and um, buildings are reopening to allow people to come back from working from home. So one issue that's uh, particularly big in New York City is that um, they still want to enforce social distancing in buildings, but they're worried that if everyone comes back to buildings, there is going to be massive queue buildup for elevators. So you and that's going to cause a huge amount of people in lobbies, and like they're not going to have space to social distance. So the issue is like elevators can only have now like two or two or four people, depending on how big the elevator is versus normally you could pack like 20 people in it. Um, so this is to respect the social distancing rule. So we've been working with actually the New York City mayor's office on how to deal with this. And um, the challenge is actually a lot of elevators are not programmable. So um, we've been designing interventions that basically allow the elevators to be more efficient so this way you can process people faster. And the way we're gonna be more efficient is by allowing people to cut the line essentially in order to go to get people going to the same floor to travel together in the elevator. So um, I have a little video to explain this um, to show you, you know, some Columbia research that's happening and I'll share it with you now. Sorry if it's not as good as uh, uh, some uh, films, but uh, you know. We did our best. Sorry. Uh, may have messed this up. Before the COVID-19 pandemic, elevators were crowded as people rode together to get to their floors faster. 
Elevators would simply fill up to maximum capacity in the lobby floor during rush hours in order to get people to their floors quickly. But more recently, to allow for social distancing, capacities have been cut significantly. If buildings reopen fully, queues will blow up during rush hour, which can be unsafe and lead to more disease outbreak. Fortunately, a team of researchers at Columbia University have discovered two simple interventions that can be used to reduce queue lengths. The interventions do not require programming the elevators and rely only on guiding passengers. The first is cohorting. Anyone in the queue that is going to the same floor as the first passenger can form a cohort and ride together. After this cohort boards the elevator, repeat until the elevator is full or the queue is empty. The second is queue splitting. In the lobby, create mini queues for separate groups of floors. Arriving passengers join a queue corresponding to their floor group, and the queues are processed in a round-robin fashion. When an elevator arrives, the current queue sends enough passengers to fill it up or empty the queue. The researchers conducted simulations based on a real 25-story building during the morning rush hour. They compared the traditional way of loading elevators, known as first come first serve, with the two interventions. Using the traditional approach, the queue length in the lobby keeps growing and growing. However, the cohorting and queue splitting interventions make the elevators more efficient and can keep the queue lengths at a manageable and safe level. Please see the research paper or contact the team for more information. Um, so yes, that's, uh, that's something we've been doing. The other thing I, I wanted to comment on is just on education. So one, one thing that's happened is that um, I think there's a lot more excitement for science and analytics because of the COVID uh, situation. So um, this is good, I think, because it's encouraging people to get, uh, to, to, um, get educated and, and have a chance to impact society. And another thing that happened is um, a lot of standardized testing was removed in the last year or two. Um, as yeah, Khaled, you probably know this too, that uh, because of the inability to take standardized tests, um, the requirement has dropped. And one benefit of this has been a much more diverse student body in our admissions. Um, so generally, you know, standardized tests can be gamed through lots of um, paid training and mentorship and uh, test prep. And when you remove that element and people have to decide on other things, it turns out that you can, you get a more diverse student body. And, and I think you know, the results are still early, but I don't think there's been a really big change in terms of the academic quality of the students that are admitted. So I think actually the, the way we think about admissions to graduate and undergraduate programs will permanently change after the pandemic, but how exactly is, is unclear. Yeah, and from my perspective, I've seen the just PhD applications are up in general in the business schools across the country. And I think it, it just in all graduate programs, people have been looking because because there's the rapid, the higher unemployment numbers, everybody's going back to school, which was counterintuitive because you think the, the experience of being in a university at this time would be would be difficult during COVID, but that's not the case. Um, and the, I run a lot of pre-doctoral uh, research programs and the application numbers have not suffered at all, or they're actually higher than they were before. Um, so it's just, I think it's becoming much more competitive and there's a larger pool of applicants and um, makes it for probably a better experience for the students and the faculty that way as well. Um, let's see, the next question. And uh, for the people that are attending this, um, if you wanna, start putting questions in the Q&A box, because uh, after this question, we'll, so I'll start taking your questions and uh, putting those to the panelists as well. Um, final question, new paradigms of mass scale working from home and in remote teams have caused many organizations and professionals to rethink what is possible in a post COVID world, uh, but what's desirable or ideal. Um, looking to the future, uh, what, uh, what skills, practices are gonna uh, are gonna stay, or um, are we're gonna leave behind in terms of the post-COVID world? Uh, why don't we start with Saham this time? Sure. Um, so, I mean, I will say I've had my own personal journey with work from home. You know, started off being quite excited about it because I thought, you know, I can wake up a little bit later and 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 
you know, do what I want to do at home before having to rush to the office, especially in Kuwait, where uh, we have quite quite bad rush hour for those who are not familiar with Kuwait. Um, but, you know, I mean, 12 months later, I think uh, my perspective has changed. I think there's a lot of benefits of working from home. And, and you know, I think I've seen my team in Kuwait and then obviously the, the broader management team in London that I work with remotely, you know, and, and I have before the pandemic, you know, I've seen people be very, very efficient and effective and be able to really get everything they need to get done done and, and you know, have the resources and tools to be able to do that. Um, you know, I think, and, and I think it's something that, you know, as a company, we've already kind of accepted and, and we want to have a global work from home policy um, for, for everybody to be able to take kind of a couple of days a week and, and be at home. I've seen particularly parents, it's just been huge for them to be able to work from home and, and not feel uh, like they are the odd one out or that they're taking an exception or anything like that. You know, it's just kind of part of the culture. And so they're able to stay at home uh, with their kids and, and other people with, with different circumstances. I think it gives people that that a different kind of level of comfort um, and, and extending work from home policies beyond the pandemic, I think is a great, um, is a great release for companies to kind of give back to employees and team members and, and, um, and allow them some of these kind of small flexibilities that, that go a long way. So, I mean, I, I think it's not always, you know, sometimes you want to be in the office and I think it's not anything tangible, nothing more than just, you know, sometimes it's moral support, sometimes you want to see each other and, and there's a certain, um, you know, depending on the type of work you're doing, I'm sure in, in, in the film industry, you kind of are in the same room, you're making a movie, there's a creative process. I think for a lot of businesses, uh, tech companies and, and kind of global companies, we're very used to being able to be kind of remote and effective. Um, but I think there is something about being in the office and having that office space and knowing that you can go when you wanna go um, that just gives you that kind of con a different level of connection and, and, and support as a team. Uh, but I think, you know, I, I think going forward, it's just most companies, I think most companies, especially with with younger generations of, of, of employees with millennials are, are adapting to, to kind of this new way of working. And, you know, it, it's, it's good for our budget, uh, our overall budget. It, you know, we don't need as much space. We can have that kind of hot desk flexibility. Um, so I, I think this has been one of the biggest things, honestly, apart from the industry, apart from learnings, like just this idea of working from home and being able to do it comfortably and, and no one getting kind of, uh, it, it's never awkward now. Someone's cat is walking around in the background or someone's kid, you know, it's just kind of the norm now. And I think that just gives people that, that level of comfort to be able to do this and not feel like they're doing something exceptional. Um, so, you know, I personally work from home at least once or twice a week. I'm actually personally recovering from COVID right now. So I've been working from home and ready to get out of here. But, um, you know, before this once, twice a week, um, with a lot of kind of safety measures and, and, um, you know, making sure that we're distant from each other and, and we're doing all the right things. But yeah, I think, I think it's been a, it's, it's been a huge shift. I think it's the biggest, one of the biggest I've ever seen kind of within companies and organizations in terms of the way we work and the way that work culture is. Um, so yeah, you know, and I wonder actually, as I was looking at that elevator video, I mean, we have a lot of these elevator queues in Kuwait and I wonder if anybody has thought about kind of how rigid we are about work hours. You know, we're always talking about 9 a.m. start time or X a.m. start time. I wonder if there's anything around kind of scheduling time slots that, that changes, you know, when people are coming in and avoids this kind of bulk of people. Um, cause as societies, we've kind of agreed that nine to five is the number, but you know, why not nine to five or nine ten or nine fifteen? It's, it's, um, I think when people also have the flexibility to work at different times and not necessarily come, uh, at a fixed time, it, it helps with just overall traffic and, and, you know, elevator traffic and other places, car traffic. So, uh, it just made me think when I looked at that. So maybe I'll shift it over to Adam so he can answer that question. <laughs> Yeah, you were yeah you you were meant to do operations research. That's my field. So <laughs> we we dream of such efficiency, uh, but yeah, we're stuck up with societal norms. Um, but uh, yeah, that's that's a great point. I think um, you know I I think I well I don't remember the exact question actually. <laughs> Can you remind me? I, I was just saying I wonder if people have thought about like coming scheduling hours so not everybody's coming in at the same time like rush hour is at nine everybody's waiting for the elevator people came in like you know your time slot is 9 15 or 9 20 i mean it's hard to get to the to that level of detail but i wonder if if that was something that came about in the research yeah actually yeah so they they uh yeah right so th they did try to do those uh things at least in some of the government buildings we were talking about but um what happens is then like um you know, kids like uh, are big problems. Both kids, they're on schedules with their schools and, and 
people's lives have already been optimized around their kids' schedules. So it's it's hard to change this equilibrium uh, in general. But I think what what people are doing is just trying to be flexible. Like, okay, you're gonna be late. You'll you'll make it up at home. Whatever. You don't have to be here exactly on time. So I think flexibility is definitely increased. And I'm not sure like the expectations um, change change a lot. Um, but w one thing I just wanted to comment on about like long-term change, I think is uh, also, I uh, I think for me personally, as, as a, like an educator, I appreciate a lot more like the mental health aspect of, of like being a student and um, all the challenges that come with like group, like working in, in collaboration with teams remotely in person and all the stress that, that comes along with that. Um, and I think because the pandemic has brought a lot of mental health issues, I think it's raised just more general awareness overall. Um, and I think that's that's another good thing that, that has, has come out of, of this. Um, uh, Sam, long-term effects, for, or sorry, the, the new paradigms and uh, just how things have changed and what, whether those changes will stick around. Okay. Sorry, um, it's funny because before the pandemic, you know, artists used to work from home. You know, people go to work and we sort of sit and, and, and create or write, whatever. So I've, I feel like now everyone is, is a writer at home and it just feels weird. Uh, so, so, so nothing changed in that world of, of to be home, working around your kid's schedule, to try to find space to be able to create your next thing. It's, it's been, I guess, since I graduated, that's been the dilemma of my life. And I'm sure many other filmmakers around the world is, you know, and we had, we had, you know, we took refuge in, uh, in, in, uh, in some coffee shops here and there just to see a sense of humanity around us while we do. So if you've seen a lot of writers sitting in a coffee shop, you know, it's just because they just needed a little time to get out of the house. So, so for me, it's, it's very interesting how the world becomes like that. And now, uh, you know, I feel like there's less creativity as a result, uh, in, a, in a sense, because, you know, you teach on screen, you read scripts on screen, you, meet, you do your meetings, the meetings you used to have to sort of, oh, I have a great new idea you want to share with somebody, whether it's a producer, or you used to choose a time and place to go meet. Now we do it on Zoom. So, so everything... And I, I feel like it's just everything starts to become, um, uh, you know, less, less, less humane in a sense. And because of it, I think that it affects the way you, you see characters that you're trying to, to write about. Um, so in many ways, I, we wish that everyone else go back to work so we can still be at home. <laughs> There's one way to look at it. And, and the, other, the other part of it, which I think is very interesting, one of the things that gives you energy to keep doing what you do is that interaction at the end when you have the final project, going to a festival, meeting people, screen your film, and have that human interaction with the audience, which now was replaced with Zoom meetings, is, is, is really lacking. So I think, first of all, I feel like in general, I think most more people are, are, are looking forward to go back to theaters, to, to cinemas, to just go see something, talk about it after that culture is, uh, is, much, uh, is, is much needed, I feel, in many ways. So how the industry, I think some stuff will be on, still on Zoom, but the creative process is, 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 is not very happy with that space. But the meeting and efficiency of not having to go to Los Angeles or to France to meet uh, you know, a film fund that could be done, that, that saves a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, that, that becomes more efficient. I think a lot of people will take that as an option from now on. It's interesting because actually one of the marketing professors in the business school, she's actually looking at uh, creativity and innovation and the differences between Zoom and in-person and just how emotion translates over Zoom and things like that. So it's actually an active area of research that they're looking at right now. That's great. Um, so we're starting to get questions in the chat, so I will try to go through these. Um, the first one is directed towards uh, Siham and Sama. I really like the example you gave about people ordering popcorn delivery to watch movies at home. Do you think there are other in-person experiences that people are trying to repl replicate 
uh, from home using delivery services? And do you think these practices will stick around? Oh. Interesting. Um, I mean, that's been the big one. I, I think the, the cook from home practices where people are ordering different things to cook or we have something, I mean, this is very specific to Kuwait, but it, during Ramadan, we have something called Girgian, which is kind of like our version of Halloween. And usually people, kids go out and they collect candy and stuff like that. And, and this year, everybody's putting their, you know, all these restaurants and, and candy shops are putting in their special Gyan packages on, on delivery and people are ordering that and sending it to different people. So, I mean, I've seen some creative things in terms of people trying to take something that's usually an outdoor experience and, and, and bring it at home. Um, but yeah, that's the, the only one that comes to mind. I think the popcorn, I think it's a big thing for, for I, I think it's, I think the, the, the popcorn delivery service in the last 12 months has saved our, our biggest kind of um, a theater company in Kuwait called uh, Cinescape. So I think it's been huge for them. I think they're hoping people will go back to the theater um, but you know, they're opening up in a couple of weeks. Let's see, let's see if that sticks or not. But I, I am a fan of staying at home, especially when I think depending on the culture and the type of place you live in, you know, when I used to live in New York, I think it's very difficult for me to imagine wanting to stay home all the time and watch movies. I like that experience of going out, but I think living in a place like in Kuwait where, you know, houses are much bigger, people get together. I think you can imagine that people are going to want to have a big screen TV and, and some popcorn delivered. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the example that comes to mind though. Um, the next question for Adam, when we see, uh, when will we see that queuing project implemented? Have companies or buildings uh, implemented it or tried to implement it so far? I think, I think Sama, you wanted to say, you wanted to say something, I'll, I'll let oh, you go sorry. first. It's, sorry, yeah, I missed. Yeah, yeah, no, I just wanted to follow up, but I could, I could do it after in the next question. Let's follow up a whole the whole event that, that people create at home now with delivery and stuff. I feel like it's not just uh, uh, you know I just I just did actually uh, last week a magic show at home uh, uh, that comes with a box that arrives before the show that has you know a popcorn bag in it and and so the, so people are creating these key kind of events around the the family room. Uh, that's not just film. It's not just you know. Uh, so it was it was a very interesting experience. I think in general, you know, what Siham I think you know is 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 looking at at the, at the family in at the core of these events because I think single adults are seeking entertainment outside their home, uh, but for parents and and families, they're always looking for occasion to kind of keep their kids because we are all home and we're doing the same thing just to create an event out of nothing to feel like it's a, it's a special day is what we capitalizing on now here. Even like, you know, the streamers have managed to make more money of releasing family movies than, than theaters. They, they, have, they don't have the same expenses, but you go, and I don't know if you, if you notice, but those films are $25, $20, uh, and and it's easy to access it at home so it, it's 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 interesting how this like especially like disney and all these big family studios how they will uh, uh, if, if things open up will they still do that or they'll go back to theaters theater releases and stuff uh, but for now they managed to find a way to keep it exciting that's a, as it's an event around food family entertainment um, so my feeling is going to stay a little part of it, but that other part is, is going to be moved into the actual place. Uh, let's see. Oh, Adam. So we'll, I guess we'll go back to Adam now then. So yeah, to, regarding this uh, queuing thing I showed you, we, we, um, so New York is still not really close to, at least the government buildings, they're still not really close to um, opening fully. So um, the short answer is uh, we haven't had a chance to implement it yet just because it's only this kind of project is only useful if there's actually enough volume of people. So right now the volume is still pretty low. Um, but uh, yeah, suddenly I realized when you guys were talking that um, I've definitely seen my own family a lot more uh, <laughs> because of all this. Uh, so it's uh, another indirect uh, benefit. 
how have you all been managing, I guess, the, the work-life balance issue? Does, like, we work bleed into your personal life and um, given that you're working remotely from home? I think the lines become very blurred um, when when you're working from home and it's like, but I, what I've done is I have a, you know, I have a desk and an office space and I'll walk, cross that line in the morning at nine. I'm like, okay, I'm at work and then cross, cross back into the rest of the house and say, okay, now I'm out. But again, I mean, I appreciate that this is easier when you live in a place like Kuwait where it's quite big. So I physically isolate the place where I do work so that I can separate myself. I think in the early days of the pandemic, it was just like my laptop is just with me all the time and I'm constantly working from different places. But I realized that creating this physical space where I could enter and exit helped me really kind of separate and be like, okay, I'm, I'm no longer working. I'm in the part of the house that's fun and cool and I'm no longer in kind of the workspace mode. So uh, that actually helped me quite a bit. Sama? Yeah, I mean, it was it was a tough adjustment. I mean, we live in New York. We don't have the space that we, <laughs> you probably have. So we had to, you know, I took my my son's room. I took over my son's room and I and my kids took the the basement as a school and that. So we managed eventually, but that took a two, three months of just trying to figure out what we're going to do. But once we had it, I think we all set in, uh, uh, you know, set in our zone. But but again, it's 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 hard. It's it's very hard to just turn it off and on kind of thing, you know. When you need a, a, an important creative Zoom, and then you have to snap out of it because it's you know the kids' lunchtime from school, and you have to run, do that, and and come back. So it was, but you know, it, it, at the same time, you know, I think the hardest part of Zoom for me and is 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 you know, seeping into the next question that I see is, is you lose your personality on screen. Like you lose, you lose a lot of who you are and, and what makes you tick sometimes on, because of that delays a few seconds could kill humor, you know, it, it's, <laughs> you know, so that, that kind of reality, I feel like affects the way people sort of, uh, the way they accept each other's back and forth. Like, I think people become a little bit more sensitive. What do you mean? But just because of, of these delays, like you, you lose, you lose the sense of humor as a result, which I miss a lot. I actually, I had my, my first in-person class uh, last Wednesday and it was just amazing for hours. I didn't even feel them, uh, but it was, it was a lot of that kind of, you know, you suddenly see the students, you see their personalities, uh, interacting there's there's a there's something beautiful to that that makes it um it makes makes even education more fun in a sense so uh. I, I think there's a uh yeah for me it's it's been very hard to to separate them but that i think that's that's always been hard for me but uh for the other the other day I, I was thinking about a research problem and i emailed a, a colleague who, who's having his retirement birthday party like next week and I sent him an email like 3 a.m on a Friday night because obviously I was doing nothing and I just had this idea and uh he's 85 and he responded like an hour later <laughs> I was like why are we both doing this <laughs> right now and uh I just thought it was it was funny but there's this I thought that I found this really um nice article uh, maybe some of you have read it about a concept called languishing it's in the New York Times uh this week so like a lot of us have been feeling not necessarily depressed, but kind of just stuck in doing a little bit of nothing and a little bit of everything all the time and a lot of joyless activities. And, um, you know, there's the name for it is, is, I guess, called languishing. And I think this is like something I've noticed in myself and a lot of people. Um, so when you describe like going back to the classroom, that sounds super fun. I'm, I'm tired of making jokes to a uh, a blank uh every, all muted audience and just feeling uncomfortable uh yeah i used to i used to do stand-up comedy when i was an, uh, a phd student and that's what it reminded me of just making bad jokes and people looking at you funny <laughs> um so yeah yeah for me when just living in a studio initially it was like really tough and then i finally was able to upsize given the rent drops in new york so um, that made it a little bit easier. And then I think the first thing I do in the morning is just take a walk, act like I'm commuting to the office. And just so I, because if I don't do that, I sometimes I'll find myself sitting and 
working and not having seen fresh air or anything like that at all. Um, so it's just try to take those normal breaks that you would while you're at work, which you tend not to do when you're working at home. Uh, let's see, another question. What are some lessons learned about managing a team remotely? What qualities and habits make for good team cohesion over remote work situations? Anybody want to start? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can go. I think one thing that's worked well for me is, is I, I feel like for, for me, and I think a lot of team members being on Zoom and video calls for long periods of time, it's kind of, it's just difficult. It's not as engaging. So, uh, you know, making meetings a lot shorter, spreading them out. So instead of even a half hour meeting, once a week, we do 15 minutes twice a week, or just kind of make the meetings a bit shorter. You know, I, I think it's important not to, you know, not to forget that it's still a meeting. And even though you're on, you're on camera, it doesn't mean you can't socialize a bit and talk to, to each other and, and kind of be, try as much as possible to bring out kind of the, the regular personalities of everybody on the team. Um, I think those are two important things. I think forcing people to have their camera on, I, I don't think it's a thing in a problem in a, in a place like New York, but in the Middle East, You'd be surprised how much people don't, don't want to show their face or think it's, you know, oh, I can just turn it off. Uh, so I think making people kind of show up, seeing their faces, making sure that, that you kind of get a sense of where they're at and identifying their surroundings and feeling connected to it. I think it helps just make everybody feel at ease. Um, but yeah, and sometimes we've even scheduled, you know, time just to get on calls and really not have a strict agenda or have lunch together or something that makes us feel normal. Uh, but I do think the biggest one I have to say is just making meetings shorter. I think no more 60 minute meetings as much as possible, cut things short, have them spread out throughout the day so we can connect more often, but for shorter periods of time, um, just keeps people more engaged and, and helps them um, avoid kind of feeling this lull in the day of constantly going from meeting to meeting. Um, but yeah, there's not a lot, you know, I think there's nothing like being in, in, in the office together when, especially when you're going through kind of ups and downs and volatile times and, and tough decisions. But, um, you know, some of these little things work. Adam? The only thing I would add to that is uh, I agree to just cut down on those things, but I also added one kind of meeting, which is like once every few weeks, it's a meeting about nothing. So just to hang out and uh, just like remember that we don't have to just talk about work. So that's, that's something I do. And my lab is very small, just like 10 or 12 people, but that's something that people now look forward to. Slama? Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I surprisingly, what's interesting about Zoom that everybody's on time, and it's kind of it's it's really <laughs> nobody. <laughs> it's very like rare as someone is late, and if they are late once, they're not going to do it again because it's obvious. Everyone can see it, kind of thing. It's a, uh, it's uh, it's interesting that all meetings that I've been going on through the whole, they always been happening on time. Uh, but again, I, I I feel like after forty five minutes you need a break. I, it just it just it doesn't make sense to keep going. I think I found like the most creative time is it, it, it happens right after the break or at the beginning. Like if especially like a, you know if you're in a writer's room, you work with other writers, those ideas. But after a while, I think it starts to feel like I, with time it starts to feel like you it, it's 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 plateauing a little bit. So. I think, you know, one thing I think to run a room, I think uh, uh, efficiently, I think you have to be able to read that room. As, as Adam said, it's very hard when you can't hear anyone breathing to understand what's going on. Uh, but I think naturally that's what we need to know is, is, is when to stop for, even like for five minutes, let's go just, I, you know, even in classes, you know, okay, let's take five minutes, go for a quick walk around the house or so, do something, get some water, come back naturally you start all over again. And, and especially if you wanna deliver something important, you need to, to sort of organize it and know when people actually are listening and not surfing the net. Cause that's the other thing that I think it's hard to manage, which is not knowing what everyone else is doing. But if you wanna keep thinking about it, it's kind of bothers you as well. And it's like, are they listening or are they reading the news or they're watching Netflix, I don't know. You can't tell what's behind <laughs> that face looking at the screen. So it's a very, uh, it could be, a, a, you know, something that I think down the, down the road, I think people need to figure out a way to manage that. I don't know how, but I think Adam, this is maybe your, how to control, how Zoom can control people's laptops <laughs> while having a meeting. Actually, that's, that's actually a controversial issue. So there is a big, 
<laughs> issues with like proctoring exams and whether or not we should use the webcams to see what they're doing while they're taking exams. And uh, it became like a, a lot, very problematic. Eventually Columbia settled on like not really using those kind of technologies as because it was like an invasion of, of privacy. But. <laughs> Sorry, I was on mute. Last question, uh, Sam. Uh, with regards to the dependence on co-production with European companies, how has this been affected by the pandemic given the medical apartheid taking place? Um, how does this affect the timeline uh, and the extent to which you can actually go back to work, especially with the access to vaccines in Palestine and in Europe? You know, I mean, this is, this is a big challenge. I don't know. I don't have an answer to it, really. It's, you know, the lack of vaccination in, uh, uh, in parts of the Arab world. I think, you know, a, a big a, a big production, I mean, even in Palestine, a lot of the productions have been happening in Jordan. And Jordan also is affected very badly right now. So, uh, so Jordan has been used production-wise to replace, you know, Palestinian uh, locations in many ways, as, as closest in, uh, you know, topography and all of that. So uh, the issue is, is also the major countries in Europe that are, uh, that are part of this co-production production scheme are, are, not, are not successful either. France is really struggling behind, which is a major, I mean, France is a major player in, in those co-productions with the Arab world. Uh, they're struggling themselves with vaccine. So I think, you know, that part of Europe combined with these, you know, Palestine and other regions in, in the Middle East, uh, uh, that's why nobody's shooting right now. That, that's why many production, actually, I know that there was five productions happening in Jordan and Palestine that they were shut down after, uh, after COVID. Uh, and now, now it just came back. So I think some of them just came back recently. Uh, I mean, this is, I mean, part of it, I have my next movie that's set in the Middle East is, it takes place in Gaza. And, and one of the reasons we're not sure if we can shoot this year is that, that exact reason. So I'm going to have to wait it out. And that's why I think also a lot of people are moving, I would say, noticing many people in, who used to make movies are now have moved to TV, making TV series for streamers. So I think that took over. I think many people are saying, oh, we don't need movies anymore. Everyone's watching, you know, binging on TV shows. So I think there are, there are more television productions in the process than, than independent films because these, these TV shows have more funding as a result as well, which is, brings us back to that. If you have more money, you, you can manage the pandemic. If you, you don't have it, you're going to be struggling. So... I'm curious, we'll, we'll be seeing. I mean, you know, in my career personally, I mean, I was just happened to be in that phase was I was not ready for production. Like I kind of wanted this year after my last film to be writing. Uh, so I, I, I never pushed for any production yet, but I think we we're talking with our producers that the beginning of next year is probably a good time to do that. Okay, so I don't, we don't have any more questions and we're running up on the hour here. So I just want to thank all the panelists for a great discussion. Um, thank you to the Colum uh, Columbia Alumni, Arab Alumni Association for setting up and hosting this event. Um, and thank you all for attending. Any final words from the panelists? So I'll pass it yeah, back. Thanks very much. You guys are making me miss New York as I see some of the backgrounds and like familiar <laughs> windows and bricks. <laughs> and the noise. <laughs> yeah, I'll of pass course. It back. <laughs> pass it back to Diana. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, guys. You. Thank you all. This was such a wonderful uh, discussion and Thank you so much to our attendees for coming as well. Uh, we got a lot of food for thought today. Be sure to stay on the lookout for our future events that will be posted on our website and social media. Um, we'll be holding an Arab graduation event on Saturday, May 8th at 2 p.m. Be sure to sign up for that and come support the next generation of grads who will be joining the organization, hopefully 
And we will also be holding elections for our next executive board in June. And we're going to have a general interest meeting in May. So if you're interested in getting more involved with the organization and planning events like this, be sure to um, check it out. I found that this is a wonderful way to be a part of bringing together and supporting the Arab community that has come out of Colombia and coming up with ideas on how to talk about important topics like what we've discussed today. So feel free to reach out to us if you're interested or check out our website for more updates. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank guys. You so much. Thank you.